brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chat. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, people, how are we doing out there from sunny San Diego? I'm Greg Carlwood. And I think everybody knows by now just how hard it is to step outside of a paradigm and a culture that you've been raised in as if it were the gospel truth. Of course, they say this is why colonizers are so quick to establish schools in the lands they take over, control the culture, and you control its people. And one of the primary things we try to do on THC is peel back those layers of thought control in a whole host of areas. But it all starts with a fundamental re-education about reality itself. Because concepts like true consciousness, remote viewing, free energy devices, or anti-gravity crafts will always seem impossible from the vantage point of the so-called civilized Western mainstream models. And yet, as the system does its damnedest to suppress any momentum gained in these areas, they continue to re-emerge. Hopefully one day humanity can confront this realization that many of its models are fundamentally flawed, and it's actually the ideas that have been kept alive within some secret societies, initiatory orders, and eastern religions that need to be shuffled out onto the main stage. But until that day, we'll continue to tell the tales around our digital campfire with those who have seen the light, and better yet, actually understand it. Well, one of those bright minds in these troubled times is today's guest, Ernst Wilhelm Vandenberg who has been tinkering with the world from an early age. Born in 1964 in Amsterdam, he was repairing all things electronic by his teens and built his first computer when he was just 18. He went off to university to study computer science and physics and worked in IT until 2005. Then he moved to Thailand and while looking for a new hobby, decided to take a deep dive into the work of Nikola Tesla and it's really been off to the races ever since. Now he's collected nearly all of Tesla's works and writings that aren't sealed away in classified files, has been replicating Tesla's experiments, and has written four books along the way. With titles like Tesla's Magnifying Transmitter, Recreating Tesla's Dream, The Problem of Increasing Human Energy, The Tesla Code, The Battle of Wardenclyffe, A Story in Letters, and his most recent release, The Topic of the Day, The Science of Tesla's Magic. I think it's going to be a great time, so let's do it. Coming to us from the remote rice fields of Thailand, far away from civilization, the Tesla decoder, the ether educator, and the electrical experimenter extraordinaire, Ernst Wilhelm Vandenberg, welcome to the higher side. Thank you for this. Uh, <laughs> That's quite an intro. Thank you uh, for having me. <laughs> well, I really appreciate this. I know it's not the easiest thing to do where you are. And of course, I have to thank Aaron Murakami again for getting us in touch. I saw your latest book and just had to see if we could make it happen, and here we are. To kick this off, I figured you could tell us about this period of time when you found Tesla's work, because you say in the book that you were really working towards artificial intelligence, and in a strange way, your AI programs guided you to Tesla, and that alone is intriguing, but what can you tell us about this period of time where your focus really shifted to where it is now? All right, so... I just moved to Thailand and I had to leave my job in information technology behind. So I was looking for a way to make some money. 
I mean, I'd done so before playing the stock market. So I thought I could use my knowledge of artificial intelligence to create something to analyze the stock market and help me invest my money. Hmm. So while I was doing that, I made something that worked pretty well. And every time it worked well up to a certain point, and then it deviated from reality. So I started looking into that point, what happened at that point. And I saw that there were large gold transactions happening then, very, very large gold transactions. So since no one has the money to play with tens of billions worth of gold, I started looking into the gold market and I found that the role that JP Morgan played there. So I started investing JP Morgan and I found Wardenclyffe. And that immediately caught my attention because, yeah, who is going to build such a huge tower and what is the purpose of all that? <laughs> so then I read about Nikola Tesla and I knew him because I've heard of Tesla coils before, but not much more. And then I saw that he did quite a lot more than just build Tesla coils. So I wanted to know more about that. And I started reading into that. Perfect. I think that's awesome. And you go on to say that it took you 20 years to arrive at the conclusion that the goal you were working towards is unattainable. And you have since found several others who have provided additional evidence that this was indeed the case too. Is the goal of artificial intelligence or conscious computers what you're talking about here? Yeah, that's my goal for artificial consciousness, really. I wanted to understand the universe. And I realized that since we are part of it, we may not be able to really investigate it, every edge of it. So we need a tool to help us. And I thought artificial intelligence would be that tool that could help us. But it needed to start thinking on its own. So it must have an artificial consciousness as well, not just the reasoning. So my interest was in creating an artificial consciousness. And I started researching that. I did that over a period of many now many, two or three decades, and then found that it cannot be done hmm. because any consciousness that comes into creation creates as a necessity of its being, its existence, it creates the universe that it sees itself living in. So if one were to create an artificial conscious program, then that program would create its own universe and report about that universe, not about our universe. So there's no point in doing that with the purpose that I had. Hmm. Yes, I had that written down, that quote that for any consciousness to exist, it must create its own reality. And I guess I would ask for people who hear that, why is that? How do we know that to be true? <laughs> that is a very... It took me decades to come to that conclusion, but I think working backwards is the easiest way to understand it. So assume that you already have a computer program that is conscious, then it must be self-conscious first because it has to know that it exists before it can think that it thinks. So it has to see itself. It has to perceive itself in some form, but a running program doesn't have any form. It's just a sequence of states in a computer. It doesn't have any physical reality to it. So in order to come into existence, it will see this sequence of states, this process, as a physical entity. So it sees itself as a physical thing. Thus, it can see other processes in this computer also as physical things. So it will see everything that's running in the computer, every program, as a physical object, thereby creating its own universe, which is not our universe. It's something completely different. <laughs> well said, well said. I think that makes sense. 
And I agree with that notion that for some of these more complex or abstract things, it is typically best to work backwards. One of my favorite Carl Sagan quotes is, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe, which is just a great way of expressing that need to get more fundamental to understand the things that are built on its foundational principles. And that is how you start the book, by talking about the elements and a better way to understand reality than this idea of a random big bang. And now we're floating on this rock in space. You basically have to discard what we were taught and start with a new, truer foundation. I mean, it is complicated. How would you go about explaining this foundation to people? Yeah, that's a quite difficult thing, but (laughs) that's true. (laughs) Our consciousness, our being, our existence exists in four levels. We have a physical body. We have our thoughts, things that we can visualize, things that we can think. And we have emotions, things that we feel, but we cannot picture them. And then there's some driving force that leads us that forms our emotions into thoughts and a physical appearance. So that also explains how your thoughts can make you ill or can cure you because those, those things are all related. So we're all, those are four levels that we exist in and they're all related. Now, for example, we cannot know what happens when we die to our mind to our thinking to our soul or what you want to call it but we do know what happens to our body so through understanding that these things are corresponding the body the physical world is a, a picture is an image of the mental world which is an image of this emotional world which is an image of the ultimate source the element of fire So by looking at what happens to our body, we can draw conclusions about what happened to our mind and our soul, however you want to call it. Mm. They would basically decay and get absorbed into everything that is. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. See, some people think that we will live on, that we'll live on in another person so that our soul will reincarnate in some other living entity, whether it's a person or animal that that differs per uh, religion. But that would be, in my opinion, that would be highly inefficient because in your life you you build up many experiences and knowledge and all that will be gone when you die and then you go to a new body and you have to continue your life. That is extremely inefficient. And if you look at nature, you see that everything is very efficient actually so there seems some disconnect here hmm. so uh what i think is or what happening is if whatever you were decays and enters into new living entities but not in one piece but it's taken apart and the pieces will live on in other living entities hmm. Right, because those experiences and that knowledge that you gain, if it wasn't being utilized somewhere, then it wouldn't be efficient. Yes. Hmm. If you have to build up all your experience again in the next life, then it is highly inefficient. Right, right. Hmm. And so when it comes to the formation of the universe, you talk about it through the four elements, as you kind of broke them down for us there, as well as there being four corresponding levels to a human being, it makes a lot more sense than the current model. And it's really poetic and clear. And I wish we kind of taught everyone about the universe this way. Earth is the physical, water is the emotions, air is the idea, and fire is the source of everything. As you say in the book, you can't really know it directly, yeah. only its effects. And consciousness, people have described it as a light. You know, some it's definitely in the, the symbolism, the language we use to talk about it. It is kind of unknowable. The soul is described as a light body, but this is like the energy that we're kind of talking about that's driving what life is. Yeah, fire is represented in a force, while the other three elements 
are more material. So you see this also in particle physics, where you have, for example, the leptons. They are classified in three generations, the electron, the muon, and the tau lepton. Then when I learned this, I immediately thought there must be a fourth thing connected to these three. And this fourth thing is not material, it is a force. And later on you learn that there's a Z boson, which is indeed a force that is connected to these levels. So you see that this division in four levels, four groups, as it were, you see this repeated everywhere. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And what also really clicked for me is when you talk about the elements as male and female, or having male and female correspondence and saying that new things emerge from the interactions between the male and female elements, because we all know where babies come from, so it all starts to make sense. And you use this example of a drain in a bathtub and the forces that create that vortex that we see, a male force that pushes inward, the water, and a female force that pushes outward, the air. And in the middle of the interactions between these male and female forces, as you say, matter, or to be more precise, elementary particles are born. Can you elaborate on that principle and places we see it? It just, it does make so much sense, but are there other examples other than the vortex of a bathtub where we might see a male and female elemental force interacting to create? Yeah, that's a good one. We see that, yeah, okay. So the earth, earth is uh, female. Then above it, you see the air, which is the male representation. And on where there's these two meet, that's where life is created, where we live, where the animals live, the plants, where everything takes place. So where this male force meets the female force, that's where life starts. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great response. I mean, it's just so interesting. And for people trying to follow along as to why earth and water are considered to be the female versus air and fire being the male, from the perspective of the observer, we just said, you know, you need a consciousness creates its universe. So when it comes to earth, material objects are formed outside of us. So the direction assigned to it is inward or towards the object air. Thoughts are formed inside of us, but we see them as projected outwards. Water, those are the emotions. We can't visualize them because they're formed inside and then projected further inward. And fire, we can only perceive its effects. It's like someone or something standing behind us and moving things in front of us. So it's all about the direction that these things are most associated with relative to the observer. Because again, it all comes back to The conscious observer is the center, so to speak, of the universe. Yes, exactly. So the male force is always directed outward, and the female is always directed inward. That's how they are represented. Yes. I just love that general perspective. It's a very cohesive story. It's it's, uh, holistic, and it just kind of creates a paradigm that, I think is a lot more coherent than this random explosion reality that we're given. Exactly. uh. Also, you can see the explosion universe, the Big Bang theory. They think the creation must have happened in the distant past, but they forget that that thing that creates our universe has to exist before our universe and our space and time existed. So it cannot be part, cannot be subject to the time that we live in. So it lives in a different time. So it creates our time, maybe in one moment of his time, and then it creates everything at the same time. So past, present, and future are all created at the same time for this creator. Hmm. It's quite trippy. And (laughs) just to add another layer to it, because this is important to the big picture, you also note that besides just male and female, we have older and newer manifestations of the elements. And you write that force acts as the element fire and the fluid medium water. 
Through this interaction, two new substances appear, a solid made of ether vortexes and a gaseous medium consisting of electric particles. This matches the young elements, earth and air, respectively. And I just love that, but it's interesting that we have two generations of elements, and I guess that's important because a lot of people think of ether as just a electrical field of some sorts, but this paradigm that you're describing is like, no, there must be two things interacting because that's just the way it goes. And so you have you have an, an ether that's uh, fluid. Fluid. Yeah, maybe you can explain it. Yeah, yeah. When Maxwell started to think about this thing, he came up with an ether model, a model for the ether that he used as the basis for his equations to arrive at this equations. In this model, he said there's a fluid ether. We all know there's fluid ether because at his time, everyone assumed there was a fluid ether filling up all space. And there must an EM force that acts on this medium, on this fluid medium. And that creates vortices and some particles. So it creates two more particles, two more entities. So you first have the force and a fluid. They work together to create a solid, the vortex cells forming a solid and a gaseous medium consisting of the particles that move between these vortex cells. So you see again, a force acting on a fluid creating a solid and a gas. So you have the old elements first creating the younger elements. And at Maxwell's time, people said, yeah, it's a beautiful model and the results that you come up with are perfect. But at the same time, most unlikely model for the ether possible. While in, in my opinion, it is a very, very likely model to be true because it matches the four elements exactly. Right, right. And that elegance is kind of what you're looking for in a good model. And this whole idea of birthing substances from the interaction between two other substances, it just makes me curious about something, this is quite extreme, but something like bringing new universes or at least galaxies and nebula into being. If you could harness the right plasma fire seed and the right elemental water, could you generate a nebula or something like that in an, some sort of container and grow it like you would a flower? Well, that's an interesting question. I think there's the Electrical Universe is trying to do this exact thing in the Sapphire project. They are modeling the sun in an, as an electrical unit and creating the plasma around it and see what happens there. They show they can create actual chemical elements there that were not in the experiment before at that time. So. It shows some stage of creation, I think. Wow. Wow. Oh, man. I know, um, you know, Eric Dollard's done a little experimentation in that realm. I know you're familiar with him through the forums and through Aaron, but uh, it's a trippy idea. But there seems to be a relationship between plasma and life. I don't know what it is. It's a very complex relationship because we have our consciousness creating the universe for giving physical appearances to other processes, as it were. And as some of these processes we see as other living beings, others we see as plasma or universes, it's pretty complicated because everything connects together. Our consciousness creates this physical world that we see. And it is in reality that these are just processes running somewhere and we, our consciousness, gives it a physical presence. And some of this presence we see as living beings, some we see as galaxies, some we see as metals, whatever, what you have, what have you. So everything connects together, but everything is in fact just consciousness. Hmm. 
So a lot of this is obviously related to the work of Tesla, and you've done so much reading and studying of his primary writings to get back to him a little bit more. In this book, you write that Tesla was no madman. You need to see through the outlandish claims and understand his situation and his time. Well, what context is important for people in this regard to really understanding the man? How do we put him back in his proper context? Yes, you have to go back to his time. But as I say, when you read his work now, in our age, then you see he writes about ether, and we don't believe in ether. You see him write about atoms, and we think about atoms in a certain way. We see a nucleus with the electrons circling around it. That is not what Tesla saw. You have to realize all these things, all these changes. When Tesla talked about the ether having in it another medium that you could call electricity, a gaseous medium that causes electrical effects, then you have to think when he talks about electricity, he talks about this medium. He does not talk about moving electrons and charges as we see them. Because when you at school learn about electricity, you learn electricity is all about electrons. Well, that is a very limited view because an electron is a negative charge. So where do the positive charge come from? So there has to be something else that creates both positive charge and negative charge. And that more fundamental thing, that is what Tesla was talking about, not electricity as we see it today. Yes, that makes sense. I mean, the terms do kind of change. Their meanings are different. Plus, you have people throwing a lot of hyperbole on it. Yeah. And in that, you go on to say that people might need to understand the message he was trying to convey. What do you think his primary message to the world was? I don't know what his primary message was, but I know what he wanted to give the world. He wanted to give the world a way to communicate all over the world, which we have today through the internet. And also, free energy. He wanted to have everyone access to energy in an easy way. He designed all that, and that's what he wanted to give to the, to the world. And then he saw this new science coming up from the works of Einstein and his proof. And that was trying to push a different paradigm. And that would obscure his views. So he was trying to fight the new paradigm, while parts of that paradigm may still be correct. So, for example, he said there are no transverse waves, transverse electromagnetic waves. Well, we know that there are. We can prove that some electromagnetic waves are transverse. But he insisted that they were longitudinal. But why did he do so? Because he was thinking in different terms. He was thinking of his electricity, his medium. And in this medium, he saw the compressions and decompressions. And so he saw a longitudinal wave. And he wanted to convey that to the world. We have to look deeper. We have to look at the more fundamental picture in order to understand it. And when you understand it, you can use it for these purposes. Yes. And on the subject of looking deeper... If we were to talk a little bit more about ether and this gaseous medium, a.k.a. electricity, just calling it that to simplify, it's important because when we're trying to understand this stuff, I think a lot of people just replace the phrase space is a vacuum with space is the ether, and then their understanding sort of stops there. But this male-female elemental interaction is important because the whole thing is a lot more complex. It isn't just an ether, and I guess we should think of the ether as particles that are a network of particles that are spinning in a sense and have polarity, positive, negative charge. Yeah, it's more complicated than that. But I think Maxwell gave us a good starting point by showing his four parts. So the fluid medium, 
the fluid ether, a force acting on it, creating a solid and a gaseous medium. Tesla saw only the fluid medium, the ether, and the gaseous medium, because he was only interested in electricity. So this gaseous medium was the cause of electricity or the cause of electrical effects, I should say. Ah, ah. Yes, it's very complicated to me. I am, you know, but a simple stoner host here. But your book is so full of great diagrams that, you know, really help me feel like I'm grasping some of this stuff. And it is just so difficult because of the box that we're in. As you say in, in the book, it's hard to really get blueprints of a room that you're locked inside of. It's hard to know something outside of what you know. And this paradigm is so pervasive and everybody is so damn sure that there's nothing else to learn about reality that it is hard to reverse engineer all this. and. It's important. We really should start over and, and learn things the right way because a lot of beautiful things can come out of the understanding, right? Yes, I think that's true. We are locked in our, our understanding and you have to go back to clear up all the mess that we've made. You can see that I think you can divide modern science into three groups. The, the real scientists, quote-unquote real scientists, who know that they don't know anything, but they're trying to explore reality. Those are the professors that also taught me at university. They, they tell you they know how to predict the outcome of experiments, but they don't know the mechanisms that are at work in these experiments. So that is one class of science. Then you have popular science. Popular science says that we know everything. We know exactly how everything works. We know about neutron stars. We know black holes. We know that the space is curved. We know there's uh, black of uh, dark matter and all this stuff. While the real, what they call real scientists will say, yeah, we think there must be something like dark matter. We don't know what it is, but to complete our understanding, there must be something more. And then you have, uh, what I'll call fantasy science that is People who understand that there's something wrong with the other science and they try to explain it in their own way. They try to make up some science that is basically on misunderstanding and fantasy. Now, you think that this fantasy science is something completely separate from the other ones, but in reality, the real science contains a lot of fantasy science because mm -hmm. Most of these people, they actually believe that the sun is a nuclear bomb that is exploding over a period of billions of years. And all these other things that are obviously not true, for example, that also the Earth has an inner core made of iron and nickel. That is also utter nonsense that is easily dispelled. And especially if you look at the reasoning behind it, it is completely absurd. Uh, if you want to go into that. Uh, yes, I love talking about the Earth, and I'm sure a lot of people would be like, oh, that's absurd and easy to dis disprove that it has an iron core. Sure, let us know. School us on that. The, so, <laughs> if you look at the reasoning behind this, why people believe that the Earth has an iron and nickel core, then it is because iron and nickel are the only elements that they knew before that are ferromagnetic. And we know that the Earth creates a magnetic field, so there must be something magnetic inside of the Earth. Now, this is completely absurd because we also know that inside the Earth, the temperatures are very high. And at its high temperatures, these elements, iron and nickel, do not have any magnetic properties anymore. So that avoids the whole reasoning. The other reason, is even more absurd. We find that there are meteorites, and we look what is in them, and we find that they often contain high amounts of iron and nickel. So that is the reason why we assume that the Earth core must also be iron and nickel. So this does not make any sense at all. So if you look at this reasoning, then I think, yeah, you might as well say that the Earth has a gold core, 
or it has a platinum core, it is equally absurd. There is no real reason why we assume it. Hmm. So with the understanding that you have, what would you hypothesize is in the middle? Some type of inner sun or inner plasma connecting the circuit to our sun? In a way, yes. In a way. If you look at four elements, again, then you can project these on our solar system. And you see then that the sun is, made, is the element fire. The moon would be the element water. The air, the atmosphere, and the whole, the stars, everything would be air. And then the earth would be the receiving element, earth, the physical earth. Now, the energy goes from, this comes from the sun, but gets received in the earth, heating up the inside of the earth, which is also known. And it's interesting to see that Tesla also says this. He says that the sun is an electrically charged object. It's at a potential of 215 or 216 billion volts. And so it wants to discharge some of that electricity. And it cannot do that because it's in a, in a vacuum. So what happens then is that it emits particles, charged particles, in the form of primary cosmic rays. And these particles go through the Earth, and in passing through the Earth, it, they heat up the inside of the Earth. Now, that does not match immediately with our modern understanding, because in our modern views, we say, no, there are nuclear processes happening inside of the Earth, which heat up the Earth. But in Tesla's understanding, these primary rays, they cause radioactive decay. So in passing through the Earth, they cause this radioactive decay and heat up the Earth. So these two views actually match. And so the inside of the Earth receives the energy as were from the sun. Hmm. So like a, like a womb of sorts. Yes. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I never hear it described that way. <laughs> so I don't know if anything is being born out of that, I, I, I guess, except everything on the planet. You know, you could say that, you know, that's why we call it Mother Earth. I mean, I think there's probably something to that. Yes. Yeah, there's probably something to that. But I have not explored that any further, I'm afraid. Hmm. Well... This might be a good place to bring up another book of yours, one that I was really, really interested in, but didn't get time to read before this interview. But uh, that is The Battle for Warden Cliff, A Story in Letters. Yeah. Because you took the actual correspondence between Tesla and J.P. Morgan and reproduced them, which is just such a service to the world. What would you say that you learned in that process? There are a lot of assumptions and speculation, but... Did anything you found contradict that general story that Tesla wanted to use that tower to provide power or communications to the whole world and J.P. Morgan shut it down and suppressed it? I mean, it seems like that is the general gist and it seems to be validated by these letters. Yes, I think that is validated largely by these letters. Yes. But what you do not see in these letters is that Tesla wanted to generate electricity in this warden cliff tower he kept this part very secret because i think he, he understood that that would take away the reason for investors to invest in this project especially for jp morgan who had invested largely in other sources of electrical power and also the distribution of power so his warden cliff Power, if it would replace the existing distribution system, then that would also void his financiers network for electrical power distribution. Right on. And for people who have maybe seen the picture or who understand, of course, providing 
power or communications wirelessly, obviously we kind of get a gist of that. But if Tesla's goals with the Wardenclyffe Tower were fully realized and there was no interference and we had his fully researched top of the line model in use, how would that change the way we get energy? How would that change the, the life of the average person? I, would, I think it would change it quite dramatically because, well, you can do away with all these electrical, this the whole electrical grid everywhere if you wanted to. Because with a very small set of coils, you can derive power at any place around the globe. So that alone would change the world dramatically. I think apart from that, he would also like to use it for communication and navigation purposes, but for that we already have developed the internet and GPS system, so that would not change anything anymore. But at his time, of course, that would be a revolution. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we could get rid of all the power lines, all the nasty looking electric wires running up to our house and all around the eaves of our houses and all this stuff. But when it comes to how we would turn a light on or how we would access that power, would we just have an antenna that receives that signal from the tower on our home and then everything comes from that? Or how would the average person receive that power from the tower to powering the devices in their home? I think to get enough power to generate an average household, you would need a large system. So whether someone would build that into his own house or not, I think if you can avoid that, they would. So in a community, in a, in a small village or so, I think there would be one central plant to get this power and then distribute it to the houses. I think that would be the most sensible sensible way to use it. Fair. So yes, not every house needs a receiver, just every community, every neighborhood might need one. Yeah. And then would the energy just go from there through the ground? No, no, then you just have the electrical uh, wires. Because if you send it again through the ground, then you need the similar system to receive the power again. So oh. that doesn't help. Gotcha. So we'd need the wires from the station from the yes. receiver to the home. Yes. Uh, Unless you have only a small, you need only a very small amount of energy, such as your mobile phone, then you could place some coils in your phone and receive it. Hmm. So, yeah. Gotcha. So anything that you could put a coil directly in would just be powered. Yes. Uh, see, there's the trick, of course. We're always, we're always scrambling back to that outlet, trying to get some juice, you know, and uh, that and so this would be quite paradigm changing. Yes, and also light, for example, LED lights, they use only a very small amount of power, so you can also wire them, light them wirelessly. Hmm. Yes. You have to find a way to switch them on and off, and that's the only thing. And it would be the same distribution that you could also use to get communications around the world. Yes. Exactly. Right. That's really interesting. It's the same thing. But you already have this wave through the Earth, and you can modulate new waves on this larger wave. The larger wave is the power, is the energy. And on that, you modulate smaller waves, which can be communication, messages, what have you. Hmm. By the way, uh, I understood from someone else that this system of distribution is not very clear even if you read my book i try to explain it in a clear manner but it doesn't get through too much because we grow up in a different paradigm you cannot immediately grasp this issue but i think the sense to the earth consists of two parts one is a wave a pressure wave a longitudinal wave in the medium, in electricity. So this medium, this electricity, is not a charge. This is what causes charge. So it is a gaseous medium that is 
held inside of the earth and slightly around it. And you create a standing longitudinal wave in this medium, but that does not have any electrical or magnetic effect in itself. It's only a wave in the medium that causes electric effects. So after you have this wave, you can create electric effects in it, and those get amplified and what would you call it the opposite of amplified in this wave. So you send electromagnetic signals to this medium, and this medium is also in a wave. Hmm. Yeah, it's a bit difficult to visualize, I think. <laughs> it can be, <laughs> but, you know, obviously you give all this context in the book, and then you describe the very technical experiments that you've carried out to try and follow along with what Tesla was doing. It is a fascinating journey, but it is a bit complex, and the diagrams and photos you provide are things we can't show people here. But obviously, you've verified a lot of this foundational stuff. I guess, how would you describe your progress or the state of what you've been able to achieve thus far? There are a few things that we have uh, successfully verified. I think one of these is the 11.7 hertz wave that you can create in the Earth that many people disregard it. They say you cannot have an electrical wave in the Earth because it would diminish very rapidly and you cannot reach the other end of the Earth. That is because they don't understand what Tesla was doing. He was creating, as I said before, a wave in the medium that causes electric effects and not in electricity as we know it. So this wave I could reproduce and, and I can show that this wave of 11.7 hertz that this indeed exists. Another much more important conclusion that I've been able to verify is that in an electrical discharge at sufficiently high voltage, you have more electric charge coming out of the discharge than went in to the discharge. And that way you can tap an energy source, the same energy source actually that supplies energy to lightning that we see in nature. Yes, that last part is probably the most fascinating. And is that related to what you talk about in the book as Tesla's self-acting engine? Is it tapping this same energy source you're talking about with lightning? Yes, exactly. That's the self-acting engine that is the magnifying transmitter, as it were, what Tesla describes as his magnifying transmitter. So what it does is you start it up first with conventional energy, and then you create a very high voltage. This voltage sparks to a receiving circuit, and you send that power into the Earth in a higher frequency. So this pulse travels to the other side of the Earth, it comes back, and feeds back into your secondary coil again. So it's reused in the system. So at some point, you have enough energy coming back to keep the system alive. So then you have a self-acting engine, which, of course, modern science would say, oh, that's perpetual motion that cannot exist. But in a strict way, it's not perpetual motion because it draws energy from the environment. So it's allowed by the laws of physics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I thought that was super fascinating. You talk about cooling a portion of the atmosphere and then collecting heat in the form of electrical potential. You use this to strike the Earth at regular intervals, creating a standing wave of the Earth's electricity. And then on this wave, you modulate a high-frequency signal that can be picked up by receivers all around the world basically because it's in the atmosphere, and also by our magnifying transmitter, and that would be used to keep it going. You basically use its own energy to power its, you know, its feedback loop. It's working, yeah. Exactly. You draw power from the atmosphere, and that, with that power, you keep it going. And 
you draw enough power from the atmosphere to send some power to other receivers as well. Yeah, it's amazing. And I wanted to revisit what you said about the fantasy science. It seems like uh, well, when you're talking about that, you know, there are people that create these, call them free energy devices, and you talk about them in the book as you're going through this methodically trying to follow Tesla's work and build up to something like that. But there are people who have created it and then they don't necessarily know why it works. It does work. I mean, you're not saying it doesn't work, but then they come up with a theory or they come up with new terms to describe what's happening. And that's why nothing really progresses because everyone gets confused on these compartmentalized terms. There's no unity to any of this. And if you were to start with the principles and work up that way, you know, we could maybe all get on the same page and it would be easier to to actually talk about this stuff. Yeah, so that, that's the principle. You just explained it perfectly in the way that you cool a portion of the median and you draw in that way power from the median because the medium supplies heat and heat in the medium, heat in electricity is equivalent to electrical charge. I show that in the book, but maybe that's a little bit too complicated to go into now. <laughs> but these other systems, the Comberen, I think, uh, and someone else does that too. He creates the same waveform. So you slowly build up charge, you slowly build up electric potential, and thus pressure, electric pressure, and you suddenly release that pressure, thereby you cool the medium, because that's what happens in an air conditioner, for example, too. You, you pressurize it, and then you pressurize the gas outside your house, and then it comes down to a normal temperature. Then you let it inside the house, you decompress it, and by decompressing it, you absorb energy, heat energy from inside the house, so you cool the house. The same thing happens in the system. You compress electricity, so thereby creating a high potential. You do this slowly, so you don't disturb the heat environment. Then you suddenly release this pressure, and then you cool this electricity. And by cooling this electricity, you absorb heat in the form of electrical energy, and this gets used in these systems. It's the same system you see in these small systems that from Bearden and his, the other people make. And it's the same that Tesla uses in his water and gas power. Hmm. Yes, I, I think that's a great way to summarize it. And this idea that lightning is kind of a clue, it sort of speaks to the intelligence of the universe or something that it would show you lightning and be like get you to think huh what's up what's doing that you know what how could i use this because there's bright minds like victor schauberger who have looked to nature and mechanisms of trout swimming upstream and certain things like this to then derive technologies from rather than just smashing and blowing everything up the way our conventional yeah. system does yeah. well this has been just super fascinating and really informative. I actually can't wait to get it out there to the people, but we should take some time to tell them about your goals going forward and how they can support you. I think it's a really ingenious idea, but you offer up seven possible directions for the work to go. And you say that anyone who donates should just use the last digit of their donation amount to denote which option they'd like to support. For example, if I wanted to donate towards anti-gravitic work, which is option six, I might donate $100.06. I think that's clever. Yeah, I thought so too. I, I think that also encourages people to, to actually donate something because they want to know something more. I will look into it. If you tell me what you want me to research uh, more. <laughs> right. So... You, in order, you have rebuilding the Colorado Springs Experimental Station, researching worldwide wireless transmission, researching single wire transmission, 
rebuilding a full-sized magnifying transmitter, researching downscaling Tesla's energy source, which would be those gravity waves we talked about, anti-gravity, and then fundamental research into the nature of things. Well, those are the seven options. Which one's winning? Um, so far, nothing is winning yet. I've sold 15 copies of the book, I think. Recently, I haven't looked recently, but not sold so many books yet. So, yeah, I think people are still chewing on it, and I have not got any response as of yet. Ah, uh, well, we're going to blow it up here. We're, we're blowing it up. <laughs> and there's one person that I'm uh, communicating with, and he's pointed me out some troubles that he had interpreting the book. So maybe there will be a next book in which I can explain in more detail what these problems are so more people can understand what's going on. <laughs> more detail. Man, I feel like I was drowning in detail in this book. It's, I mean, in a good way, you know. Uh, it's really impressive the way you show these graphs and then you actually have photographs of you doing the actual experiments and the, you know, arc discharges that are coming off of the devices that you're running. And it's yeah. pretty impressive. But it's very difficult, as I said, to explain what's happening in the terms that I want to explain it because people are still in this modern mindset, this more modern paradigm. It's very difficult, I found, to get the essence across of what is happening. Right. I think what's difficult for the layman to understand is what are the true implications? What are the practical applications of this work? I mean, I just read those seven options and outside of anti-gravitic crafts, which is pretty clear, a lot of people might wonder, well, which one of these would impact my life the most? I don't even know what I want. Yeah, I, I, I don't know too. And that's why I'm asking the, the, the people. I think we have to look deeper into Tesla's work because there's still so much that is not utilized. And we have to come to a point where it is utilized, where we use this new energy source, for example. We have to use it. So how do you want me to proceed and give me the means to proceed? Because I'm pretty much run out of funds at the moment. And that is also why I wrote these four books. These four books helped me to fund my research in the future. Mm. So if I was just to ask you, between rebuilding the Colorado Springs Experimental Station or rebuilding a full-sized magnifying transmitter, which of those do you think would yield the most bang for the buck? I think the option four would be better, the full-sized magnifying transmitter. But it would imply also more experiments on a smaller scale first. As I said before, we have to know, we have to at least have some idea of what the consequences are if we change the electric status of the Earth. So we have to do some more research on a smaller scale first, and then we can scale it up to the, the magnifying transmitter. It's actually the same thing that Tesla did. He first went to Colorado Springs to test the spin spools out, and then he came and said, now I have it. I want to build a full-scale uh, magnifying transmitter. Hmm. It would be great to see. And I guess I would also ask you, why move to seclusion in Thailand where really it just seems like you're further away from resources or materials or potential partners that might make this work easier? Yes, but you're also between the rice field. No one cares really about what I'm doing here. Where <laughs> if, I, if I were to build this lab in Holland, it would be demolished by police and who knows what will come to take everything apart again before I could do the, the, even the first experiment. Here, <laughs> I'm living between rice farmers who hear the noise and they think, wow, that is a loud noise. And then they go on and walk with their cow on the street and then they get to eat some grass or so they don't care what I'm doing. So, yeah, I can test here freely. Right on, right on. I like it. I like it. It conjures up provocative imagery of uh, 
what you might be doing out there, but <laughs> that, that's cool. I can tell you it's very, very loud when you have a, a spark gap coil that takes 60 kilowatt. It's like a machine gun going off. It's very loud. Is it dangerous to be near some of this stuff? No, I still live. But uh, <laughs> I, w- I wouldn't stand next to the coil because it may arc to you and, and you probably will not tell the tale. <laughs> right, right. Mm. Well, I guess, is there more to tell people about donating or your future goals or anything else they should know going forward? Yeah, I think I summed it up in the last page of the Science of the Slash Magic. If you skip to the last page, last pages, I think it's, uh, let me see, 132. You see these options and you see the ways in which you can support my product. It's either through cryptocurrencies. I give you my cryptocurrency addresses or PayPal. You can go to PayPal me slash Ernst Willem. That is my name. E R N S T W I W L E M. And there you can support me, but also by buying the books that I wrote, you support me. So buy the books, I would say, and, mm-hmm. and help me out that way. Yes. And I will include the links to as much of that as I can. Some of the cryptocurrency addresses are a little more complicated. Uh, I don't know if you can just take a photo of a QR code and then reproduce it and get it to show up accurately. But I'll I'll definitely do my best to make it easy for people to follow up on this. And of course, The Science of Tesla's Magic is the book. And will you be presenting at Aaron's next conference, perhaps? I don't know yet. At the moment, I'm very short on cash. So to travel to America is not an option right now. Ah. But it may be later. Who knows? Who knows? The future may look very different. Hey, well, who can put a price on the guy unlocking Tesla's magic? I don't know. (laughs) Well, I'm just messing around. But it is really important work you're doing, and I really value your time. Thanks for going through the effort, the logistical energy put forth to actually make this happen. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks again. Amazing work. Keep doing what you do, and stay safe out there. Well, thanks for having me, Craig. I hope it will reach a new audience through you. I think so. I think so. All right, man. Well, enjoy uh, the morning there, I guess. <laughs> I will, I will. This is the way, higher side chatters. This is the way. <laughs> Another look under the hood of ether physics, electricity, and the suppressed esoteric sciences. I do hope you liked it. I know we got a little in the weeds with some of the sciency material, but truth be told, it's those details and explanations that we need to understand to prove that this isn't sci-fi fantasy stuff, you know? We can't just be vague and hyperbolic. We got to actually try to understand it. And as much as I do it, I don't actually like kicking off these wrap-ups with responses to criticisms, but... We're here now, and I've had a decent amount of emails come in saying things like, I'm canceling your show because it used to be a lot of fun, spider beans and mind control beams from Saturn, and now it's just a science lesson. Or a health lesson. And I get it. I do. But I guess I'm trying to mature the conspiracy culture a little bit, if I could be so bold. And wild stuff will always be in the higher side DNA. As we used to say, we know they're lying to us, we just don't know to what degree. So we're going to consider all degrees. But if we want to make progress in bringing ether physics or the electric universe or Tesla tech back from the CIA's basement and files of redacted documents then we're going to need to spend some time with it, real time. I guess it comes down to what you're looking for. Is the higher side chats just something provocative to listen to while you stock shelves or fight the traffic back home? Or are we trying to 
rally the troops and have an impact and change the world. (laughs) Change the world. What a cliche and lame thing to say. I understand. But it is actually a pretty big deal that we have this show and it gets tens of thousands of listeners and we go to this obscure corner of Thailand and we talk to a guy living in isolation between the rice fields working on the same suppressed science that gives us the understanding of, oh, that's how electrogravitics works. That's how the elements interact and reality filters down from consciousness rather than a random explosion in the beginning of time. Now I see. I'm just saying, you gotta go to some pretty obscure places to get this information from the people firsthand who are really playing around with it. And there's also something I like about episodes that highlight guests who never asked for the spotlight. He's not really trying to be some famous talking head on the alternative circuit. He just wants to raise funds for the work, and he'll even do the exact work you want. I mean, this is a golden opportunity to fund the creation of an electrogravitic flying saucer. Now, I can't say if this particular episode will have that impact or not, but today, the breadcrumbs were laid out for exactly that possibility, right? I mean, isn't it a little exciting to be just one degree away from these things that we talk about and a credible, competent guy who can actually do the work? Even if it doesn't happen, to me, it's just really exciting and fun to be that close to it, to even dream about the possibilities. Maybe one day we'll be more organized as a force. I don't know. But outside of the science itself, We're talking with someone who has thoroughly read all of Tesla's available work, notes, and letters. Like, everything. So he can confirm some of those things that people claim without really explaining them. I mean, he laid it out there. Tesla had a plan for a flying craft with no wings or propellers. Fact. Bears beats Battlestar Galactica. You get it. So I hope you like the secret science shows, much like the alternative health shows. There's something here, and it needs to be brought out of the basement. And that means we need to be adults about how we talk about it and actually put our brains to work to try to repair the damage and actually understand it. I hope you agree, and I hope you feel that, bit by bit, a real case is being made that this is legit stuff. And most of the guests on this subject, again, don't really want to be here. Or I guess I should say today's guest, plus guys like Eric Dollard, they don't ask me to come here. They're not hucksters. They're not snake oil salesmen trying to get some captive audience. And I think that's an important distinction when trying to identify how much merit this stuff has. And if you only heard the first free hour, you are missing out, because in the second hour, we got deeper into things like the clues in the clouds, the perfect phi ratio distribution of the planets in the solar system, and what holds them in place. It ain't gravity. We talked about tarot and connecting to higher consciousness with playing cards, why D-Wave isn't really anything special, Tesla, Ether, and the flying saucer, the connection between magic and science, and the importance and meaning of the dragon in the Chinese Zodiac. You know, just stuff you can pretty much get anywhere else if you don't want to be a Plus member. I kid, I kid. But if you want the real detailed science, get the book, The Science of Tesla's Magic. And if you want to go the extra mile, donate to the project of your choice. And it sucks that you can't just listen to something, right? It's always, thanks for your time, now we need your money. Support the show, support the guests, buy the book. I get it, it's just the nature of the game, and different shows are going to speak to different people out there. That's all right. But if we ever get big enough, I do have dreams of being able to fund this stuff myself. Or instead of the money bomb like we used to do, I could say something like, how much do you need to build us a flying saucer? 20,000? Okay, well, I'll put up half, 
and then we can collect half from the audience. And getting $10,000 from 100,000 people is no big deal. Maybe a higher side GoFundMe section of the website. I don't know. I guess I'm just saying that one day I hope we can mobilize this thing to take the talk to the next level of actually doing. And then I can reveal the higher side saucer and we won't have to wonder. All in due time, I guess. Big dreams, you know? 2019 was about consolidating the sites, trying to improve the system that we use, and build us out to be uh, a bit more future-proof. It wasn't smooth, and we're still trying to tie some things up, but hopefully 2020 is where we really throw some fuel on the THC fire. And then post-2020, we're funding the proof and supplying the stuff that we want and kicking it all up a notch. And I don't know. We'll see. But for now, I am getting out of here. Big thanks to our guest today. Big thanks to you for listening. Check out the show notes for Mr. Vandenberg's donation information, and I'll catch you next time. Your move, esoteric science suppressors, liars of our electric paradigm, and molders of the mainstream models. Your fucking move. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes. And then realized it was dark outside It was a light coming down from the sky I don't know who or why Must be those strangers that come every night Saucer-shaped light Put people up tight Leave blue-green footprints That glow in the dark I hope they get home all right Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please Take me along I won't do anything wrong Hey, Mr. Spaceman Won't you please take me along the high side Woke up this morning I was feeling quite weird I had flight in my beard My toothpaste was smeared I opened my window they written my name Said, so long We'll see you again Hey, Mr. Spaceman Ha ha ha